Let me do that to make sure we're following the right protocols that uh, I hereby call the regular meeting of the Board of Education to order and uh, we'll, we'll later deal with the other issues. We'll move right to public participation. Okay. Thank you for joining us. The, and this is Mary Frances Williams? No. You're, yes. You're Mary um, Frances yeah. Williams? Okay. And I believe um, Marguerite Maddox, is that you? Okay. You'll be number three, okay, Marguerite? <laughs> you can stay there if you wish, but you'll be number three. Um, I need to tell you that um, you will have five minutes to speak, and it is the board's practice not to address comments directly. Okay. So please begin speaking. Okay. Um, the reason why... Um, I guess I have come and everyone else pretty much in behind me from Safeway Transportation and myself being a parent is because we were informed that the school bus aides uh, who are necessary to be on the buses, especially with a lot of the parents whose children have special needs, they're going to be removed. Um, I am here in hopes that something can be done to stop this. Reason being is because back on December the 14th, my son, who's 11 years old in the sixth grade, was assaulted on a school bus. And, you know, I have pictures on my cell phone, but I'm telling you, as a parent, you have no idea what that is like, opening up your door and your son's face is just beaten in. Um, and I'm just hoping and, and really praying that something can be done about this. You know, there are aides that need to be on these buses. On this one particular bus that my son was on, there was no aid. The bus driver had no idea what it had occurred with my son until another student brought it to his attention. And I'm just here to, to say basically that if, you know, Mr. Robert Bob, if he cannot uh, do what we as the parents are requesting, which is to ensure that the aides will be kept on these buses for the safety of our kids, then he needs to be removed. I mean, I've been trying to reach Mr. Bob since he arrived in Michigan, in, in Detroit in particular. And I've even been trying to reach him since this incident with my son. You know, I filed police reports with the school safety to no avail. Nobody has addressed my concerns. And so I came here today in hopes that, you know, maybe someone here, uh, I'm sure you all are, are parents, grandparents, and, and either you may have a child that is a special needs student, and you would never want to be in my shoes like I was and to have your child coming in all uh, battered and abused. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The next speaker is Sandra Hines, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sandra Hines. I'm with the Coalition to Restore Hope to DPS, who called on the citizens of Detroit to come and share with you the concerns of DPS. We, first of all, it, it needs to be put on record. We've been in several meetings like this, several of the citizens from Detroit. We love our city. We love our school district, DPS. We know DPS had problems. We know that DPS was struggling, um, like many other the districts all over the United States. But we did not expect that, the, um, that there were people in power who would turn D DPS into uh, a memory. And what I mean by that, DPS is almost totally dismantled now. Under Mr. Bob's leadership, he outsourced First jobs were people who lived in Detroit, who kids went to DPS, and who also um, participated in um, of, of making us have a strong district. He outsourced several jobs. He, he not only outsourced, he fired teachers, 
He laid off teachers to the point where we had teachers in the district who wasn't even teaching the um, courses that they went to school for. They were in classes teaching other classes, which also led to what we are seeing as it relates to AYP. I know for a fact that he um, sold some of our schools to charter schools and kept saying to us that he was for DPS and kept saying that he was here to, um, so to, to build our district and make it better when he, in, in, in his power, was able to take schools that were working, schools who were making AYP, schools that had outstanding programming and had gifted teachers. He closed schools and sold them to preachers in Detroit, and now those schools have been turned to churches, and we can't even get tax dollars off of them because they don't pay taxes if you're a church. So I'm saying that the, um, he, he also uh, uh, outsourced our security, who was trained security, people who had been trained for like 14 days coming on to the job. He, he outsourced them to an agency where the people received a two-hour training. And many of our students have been abused and assaulted by these people who they brought in Securitas. He outsourced our transportation company, sold all our buses, sold all DPS buses, and brought in a, a transportation company that's on probation for people who had assaulted kids on buses, had um, uh, sexually assaulted kids. One bus driver from, uh, 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 what is the name of the bus company? First student, First student uh, was killed, ran off of a bus and was actually killed by policemen while the kids was left. He ran off the bus. So he's been out. Now he's attacking the uh, attendance for our impaired children. It's against the law. We, we know that it's against the law for children that are, are autistic, blind, physically impaired, emotionally and psychologically impaired to be anywhere without supervision and to allow them to be to, to take our uh, bus attendance off the bus of children who we know have to be supervised you said in DPS for more lawsuits than you can imagine when the kid roll over and fall out of his seat and it's not an attendant there to help him and to strap him in right and that and so we're here to, to say to you we just like you feel about your district and where you live and how you wouldn't tolerate certain things in your district with the, the, to the district where your children go to school, we feel the exact same way about our children. We want the best quality education we can have for our children just like you do for yours. Many of you are in a position where you can pay for your child to get an education where a lot of us can't. That's why public education second is... second warning, please. 60 seconds more to Okay, speak. thank you. That's why it's so important for us to come and let you know that we care the same way about our children that you care about yours. One quick thing, we are asking Mr. Flanagan as our superintendent and, and Ms. Strauss as our president of the State Board of Education, we are asking that you rescind the order that Mr. Bob put in to, to fire and lay off the attendance because we want our children protected. And then one last thing I want to say, and, and it's going to be people come up to talk about just the shambles that special education is in in Detroit. All of the violations, he received 10,000 violations in transportation along last year. It wasn't brought out, it was hidden, so they didn't want people to know that. But you, all you have to do is go and pull it up, and you will see that there was at least 10,000 violations went in from special education parents and people that teach special education under Mr. Bob's leadership. <coughs> we are asking that Mr. Bob step down. Now, he has, an, he has a contract from what I understand, where his job is supposed to end in March. We in the city of Detroit want that to happen. We have drafted a person and some people that we are putting forth as interim suit that we want to, to be um, voted on as an interim superintendent. That's another problem. Ma'am, your time has expired, please. We got one. We are, we're the only district in the United States that don't have a superintendent. It's just not fair. We want the same thing for our kids that anybody else wants. And so we are urging you, 
and we and we we we're not asking um in a sense that um you know to make this is we're more or less demanding that our kids be detect be protected on those phones. thank you for your comments ma'am okay thank you The, the next speaker is Marguerite Maddox, which is, Marguerite's already seated at the table. Yeah. Um, oh, here it is. Here begins, begins what, what I hear, and because because I am, I am a person with the disabilities, and I benefit from all the good things that that I wish that every every student, disabled or not. Can have and looking at my school district over the years have have been disappointed in me. Okay, even even though that I'm not a parent of of the Detroit Public School, but I am a citizen who. Who believe that that the schools in, in the city of Detroit can do better, and, and with the attendance, when when I'm going to school, every bus had an attendant. Every bus had has had an attendant. Um so why why is it that that the school districts are not uh, are not concerned about the safety issue of about students. I don't care if it comes from from the suburbs of the country. We are all supposed to be supporting one another. And, and on a final note, I hope that in the future Please, please consider the safety of everybody. And I would like to see cameras or any device on um, the city buses for the you can see what goes on behind the scene. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The next speaker is Mary McKissick, and she will be followed by Helen Moore, followed by Yolanda Payne. I um uh, I was listening to the testing, and I want to first refer to it in light of the, what's happening at, in Detroit. Um, how are you going to deal with the playing field if it's unequal? Our students in Detroit are, uh, are being tested, but, but, they're, but we have circumstances with which the students are not going to do as well as they could. For instance, we have 50 to 60 students in a classroom, which is a disservice to the teacher as well as the test, as well as the students. The students are really being mistreated. Uh, the teachers 
classified. They get to their assignment in the middle of a semester. So the students miss out on all of that time. It's not fair. The other thing, the AYP schools that was referred to, they, the, the school was closed and the students were put in lower standard schools. How are those tests going to pick up that? The other thing is we have highly paid consultants while the schools are being closed. Now, we are really concerned that Robert Bob doesn't have any accountability to what he's doing. He just does what he wants to do while our students suffer. We need a person in there who loves and is very concerned about our students, the safety of our students, uh, the kind of services that they're supposed to get, they're not getting. And all of this is contributed to the fact that the funds are low. But yet and still, we can pay consultants. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The next speaker is Helen Moore, please. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, really, because um, you all are right here looking at me and wondering what we're going to say. And many times we don't have that kind of thing going on in Detroit with Mr. Bob. You know, we've been in court and we had a meeting on Saturday. And before the community spoke, Mr. Bob and his staff, outsiders, got up and walked away before they even heard what we had to say. So I'm just thankful that you all and every one of you are listening and looking at what we have to say, and we're grateful for that. Um, 45 years, Kathy knows me, we've been together a long time, 45 years I started off with the Black Parents for Quality Education and our children were not getting the kind of education they deserved. We moved into an all-white neighborhood and there were only a few of us blacks. As soon as we got to that neighborhood, the education level began to drop. So we organized and we upset the city by boycotting the school for two weeks and closing it down. Those are the kind of things that we have done down through the years because we love our children we want them to have the very best education not too long ago uh, keep the vote no takeover coalition which I chair also had a suit in trying to make sure that the elected board was maintained in the Detroit public schools we lost that suit all the way up to the Supreme Court but we came back and we were allowed to vote for an elected school board and we won that by mobilizing the community and, and telling the community that our children were important and that we had the right to vote. Many times I've been sitting here, I've been here and before all these committees, but today I'm concerned even more because how many of you remember the, uh, the case last year where the little girl in southwest Detroit was on the bus and there was no attendant and she stuck her head out the door. The bus driver didn't know, out the window, the bus driver didn't know that this child was in the back. And the bus took off and hit a tree and killed the child. If we have children, the least of these, my brother, are our children that have special needs. If Mr. Bob thinks by saving a dime, the aides don't get paid that much, that that's more important than a child's life. I am the grandparent of a child who has cerebral palsy. She's in a wheelchair. All of these children are in wheelchairs, they're autistic, etc. He took the AIDS away from them. We could not get it done in Detroit. That's why we're here. Somehow, somebody's got to listen to us to save these children's lives. I want you to know that all of our children are important to us. And we have been devastated by the uh, arrangements and the things that Mr. Bob has done to our school system. That's no lie. There are 50, 60 kids in some classrooms. Security guards have been removed who were really in tune with our children that they knew. One in particular, Southwest Detroit, one Latino guard that the children could go to and he spoke their language. Mr. Bob removed them. You have not heard the truth, and we're hoping because of some of the incidents in the United States of America where press people and folks turn a deaf ear away from the truth, that you will hear the truth today and listen, because I'm going to pass to you some of our research. We are not a bunch of stupid 
black folks and Latinos, we care about our children. Some of us are educated. Some of us even have law degrees. And so we want our children to have the very best they can, they can have. This is the research of our group. And some of the people are administrative special education people, et cetera. And they do the research. And before we get to the end of this dilemma, we wanted to beat them to the task at right now so that you will help us stop what's going on. This is information that we need. Can't get it from Detroit Board of Education, you all. They don't give us freedom of information. But we want you to look at this, and we want you to at least turn it in, and I can put freedom of information at the top, but I'm requesting this to be a freedom of information. 60-second warning, please. Okay, from Keep the Vote, No Takeover, and Helen Moore, so that you will answer these questions and maybe prevent more harm, irreparable harm, to our children. The judge has said that, Dr. that Mr. Bob has called irreparable harm to our children. Read the order, read the brief, and you will see that all the lies you've been told about Mr. <coughs> Bob is untrue and that he has been er harming our children irreparably over the past two years. Get him out. 14th, 13th District and the DFT has a resolution that Mr. Bob should be fired immediately. Mm -hmm. That is the gospel truth. And so we're asking you, don't fall for the okie doke. I'm going to use one of Malcolm X sayings, don't be bamboozled. I'm going to use one of Martin Luther King's saying, just say that Martin Luther tried to help somebody on the way, and this is the time. We're trying to help somebody, and that's our children, and the least of them are those with special needs. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next speaker is Yolanda Payne. She will be followed by Russ Vallant. Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is my future. This is the letter that I received saying that this Friday I won't have no benefits for this, my son. I don't know if everybody in here have children. I've been working for Detroit Public Schools for 10 years without a raise, without anything. I've been working in the cold, in the summer, in the hot, in no air conditioned buses when medical fragile children need buses that have air and we don't have them. I don't understand why um, he want to get rid of 88 of us. I'm here today to find, to let you all know that if you get rid of 88 of us, that's more people on the unemployment line. That's more that Michigan don't need. Michigan as a whole, we don't need 88 more people homeless. We don't need 88 more people without a job. I watch CNN sometimes. I see how the, the economy is, is, is really getting bad. It's getting worse. 88 more people? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? How am I supposed to take him to the doctor to get his shots? I'm standing here on behalf of the other 87 people that have children that go to DPS schools. I'm not asking nobody to lose their job. I don't want to lose mine. I don't want nobody to lose their job because that means it's more people on the unemployment line. I just don't understand why Robert Bob can buy a $5,000 coffee table and I have to lose my job. Mm -hmm. he, he, he came to my uni union and said that if you do a concession wage, we got pay cuts, we got time took away from us, we did a whole lot, and now he laying us off. That was just back in June when we did all this. Two years ago, he tried to lay us off. We took a wage concession again. How many more do we have to take? And he's still trying to lay us off. I don't know about y'all. This is my future. This is my son. This little boy right here. 
this one. I have to take care of him. I have to take care of him. Just like you all have families, I have a family too. This is all I have. And without this job that I'm making $10 now because he didn't took my 99 it was 10.99. All I got is $10 an hour, four hours a day. Russ Ballant. Thank you. And after Russ will be Bobby Brown Beckley. Several speakers have referred to uh, activity going on uh, and have said that uh, this is information that's not being shared with the public. I'd like to sh tell you a, a bit of why that isn't being shared with the public. Not why, but how it's being kept from the public. Um, there was a law passed that required Robert Bob to provide financial disclosure, copies of contracts and uh, other spending. Robert Bob's been in flagrant violation of that law in 2010. Robert Bob does not respond substantively to freedom of information requests. I have 32 that I put in last March. Most have not been substantively responded to and some have been fraudulently responded to. That is, they've been untrue in their denial of information. Uh, they have uh, put gag orders on all employees employees that have contracts, even those that work directly in the office of the school board, have as a condition of their employment that, that they cannot speak about the Detroit Public Schools without permission from Robert Bob. Because of that, you won't find a table of organization of the Detroit Public Schools on the website. You won't find current contracts. The last contracts were posted about 18 months ago. Um, as a result, uh, a senior administrator had to put in a plain envelope uh, the table of organization of the academic staff uh, of Detroit Public Schools, which has never been made public, at least as far as uh, we have been able to see. And on that, I found that where we used to have three assistant superintendents, we now have ten. When I looked at the ten and those who are their direct reports, um, I found that most of them were associates from Cleveland of Barbara Bird Bennett. Mm -hmm. um, it's what I've come to dub the Cleveland Gang. Uh, the worst uh, case, and I'm not going to name names, is, uh, is a person who was uh, a superintendent in a New Jersey district who was pushed out of the district for rigging test scores, for taking unauthorized bonuses has been unable to get a job in public education for three, <coughs> since 2006, but she came back to her Cleveland friend, and get, we, get, we are an employer in Detroit, and she's been promoted from an executive coach to an assistant superintendent, and is abusing the principals and being disrespectful, as other members of the Cleveland gang are. Um, we don't have any information on the second district plan, how it's going to uh, how it's going to be configured. Uh, my understanding, while well, Robert Bob's statements are that it was going to be submitted to the state today, we haven't seen anything. There has been no public comment. There's been no public review. There won't be any because we're not seeing as fit to be informed of anything going on in our school system. My son graduated two years ago. I feel very passionate about the district, and uh, I feel. Um, very frankly, that the last governor was negligent to, uh, and, in fact, collaborating in very destructive policies <clears throat> in Detroit public schools. And I'm hoping that there's leadership in this room and in Lansing that's going to start calling accountability and not taking any plans coming from Robert Bob at face value. Because I feel that Robert Bob has deceived the public has not reported. When you get attendance data from Robert Bob, don't trust it. He's point, talking 77,000 students. Wayne Reese is saying 77, 73, 4, because he doesn't want to show the huge enrollment drops that occurred under his management. We've had higher enrollment drops. That we're averaging about, we've lost 22,000 students in his two years. That's a higher average than anything that occurred under Ken Burnley or under the elected school board. We need help, and we need people exercising leadership at this table and in this room and in this department and in, this, in Lansing, because we can't get it out anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Bobby Brown Beckley. 
Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. And um, I'm a grandmother of ten, and I ha two out of the ten are special needs. In 206, I emailed someone up in Lansing, I wish I would have brought it, and they emailed me back and told them I had two kids that was going to be left behind, and could they please help me. They responded, and then they didn't respond back again. A year and a half later, I responded to them again. I tried to deal with it on my own with my daughter. They responded and told me who to get in touch with in Detroit. My grandkids haven't been tested, all right, so they don't know where they should be but they react because they're not at the level they should be. My 12-year-old is in the fifth grade at a third grade level. I asked them to quit passing him. If he don't know first and second grade, don't put him in the third and fourth. Now, he's the biggest boy in his class. And so when you call him and ask him to do something, he reacts to take the attention off of him because he don't know the word or he can't read. So then that starts commotion in the class. The principal sent him to the office. The office sent him home for two weeks. They send no homework or nothing. That's two weeks. He go back. They do it again. That's a month he out. And then it's the end of the year, and I've been back and forth, back and forth. Now it's June. School is out. He didn't learn nothing because she kicked him out the whole time. He's out now for two weeks. It needs to be something else done than kicking a kid out of school every other month and they still not educated, they still behind. Yesterday, the cab didn't pick my smallest grandson up because the oldest is kicked out. They let him out to school at 20 minutes to three. He stood out there for two hours in the cold, freezing. When I get up there, the cab is out there I said, did you come to pick up Del Don Carter? He says, yes. I said, well, you need to go into school, not sit out in the cab wondering which kid you're picking up. We get in the school. The lady said, I've seen him standing outside. I said, you didn't send security or nobody outside for a special needs kid standing in the cold for two and a half hours? What I'm asking is, quit passing the kids if they don't know. They can never pass a meat test and nothing <coughs> else if they never got the first and second grade. My kid 12 and he don't know. Where do he go on the college prep thing you got going? How do he fit in? He'll never fit in. I don't care how you work it. The other students will never fit in. It happened when I was in school. I wanted to go to college. I couldn't go when it was time to take the test and my other friends went. I was missing something from Cas Tech and Commerce. I still was missing something. Forty years later, when I went to school online, I still was missing something. I went to a university. I should have still been in community college taking over ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade classes. They make you repeat in community college, which is a waste of time and a waste of money. So by the time I went online, they took my money for me to go to college. Now I owe Citibank because they knew I wasn't ready when they took me in. I mean, I managed to get some A's and B's and felt good about myself after being out of school for 40 years. I retired from Port Mother Company, so that's where my years went. But I wanted to go to college. But I couldn't go to college because the money wasn't there. Fifty years later, the money is there. You are doing something for the children today. I admire that. But if they didn't learn when they got to the 12th grade, when you let them out, they're going right back from the 9th to the 12th in the junior college, and you're only going to have a handful. And it all don't just come from the school. A lot of it comes from home. So it's not all the teacher's fault. It's parents should be involved just as much as the teachers because when you get tired of your kid at home and you want to send them somewhere, you send them to school. But the teacher don't have nowhere to go when you send her 50 kids that don't want to listen. God bless. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker, speaker is Francis Williams followed by Aurora Harris. Oh, 
good afternoon. Um, thank you for um, giving me a chance to um, speak to this um, body. Uh, my question or concern is that I have a, a child who is uh, now a senior in DPS, Detroit Public Schools, and uh, she has an IEP. And her, the last time that the IEP team reconvened they did it without me being present and my concern is that by them removing the parent <coughs> signature from that last page of the IEP it is um, in some way falsely making the districts think that they can just do things without the parents involvement and so what um, course does do the parents have in order to correct this situation? Because there's a there's some type of a implied um, authority or whatever there for the the district that shouldn't be there where they're removing all uh They're removing everything from the parent where the parent doesn't have any rights or they think that they don't have any rights because it's implied that way when they remove that. We need to have it there in writing. So um, my question is what can be done and how soon can it be done so that this doesn't continue and happen to other parents? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Aurora Harris, please. Good afternoon. Um, I'm one of the alternates for the DPS Special Ed Wayne Reese Committee. I sit on another Special Ed Committee for parents, and I'm also on the Construction Committee at Detroit Transition Center East School, which is a vocational school for our kids that are 20 to 26 years old. Um, I've been collecting a lot of the complaints from the district, and while I would like to state that a lot of our parents are afraid to speak out because there's a culture of fear that has been established in the city, um, I'd like to just read very quickly some of the things that we're dealing with. The first thing I'd like to say is about transportation and safety issues. Robert Bob <laughs> laid off or fired all of our bus attendants for our special needs children last Friday. We are requesting that the layoffs and firings of special education bus attendants are rescinded immediately. We feel this is a manipulation of the IEP whereby many, whereby many of us for up to 20 years have never been asked or told to write that we need a bus attendant for transportation. No notification was given to parents. Robert Bob wants to save the district $2 million by placing our children in harm's way and treating 5,000 to 7,000 special needs students as if our lives or their lives are an expendable $400. There are no bilingual translators at the Welcome Center in administration, in schools or enrollment, or at the bus terminals to service non-English speaking students or parents when emergencies arise. We are requesting bilingual emergency hotline and bilingual staff and resource persons to be reinstated. There is no one to service the blind or hearing impaired. Resources like OT, PT, and speech are eliminated. Many parents, principals, and teachers are not aware of the changes to the IEP and have not been trained on the removal of parent consent, the amendment form, or the revocation form. Parents are providing information to the principals and the teachers. I'm one of the parents that's training the people, the teachers, parents, Whoever, I told my principal about the changes because I was here up north in September about the IEP changes. The principals, more than the, a lot of them in district, don't even know that the changes happened. Um, if we do not have a superintendent for special ed, are we to send our amendment forms to the State Board of Ed members, such as yourselves and Mike Flanagan, to sign? 
Robert Bob did not inform the parents, the public, or the DPS board that he has installed a new security system in the schools that scans driver's license and personal information is given to a company to run criminal background checks. Two parents have been arrested since January 3rd. Parents feel that this is a violation of our constitutional rights and privacy. We are requesting that the State Board of Education provide the parents of the copy of the order or mandate from Homeland Security that Robert Bob referred to at the January 8, 2010 DPS board meeting. Parents that refuse to give their license or ID to strangers for scanning are not allowed to enter the buildings. Why is the Detroit Public District targeted as a proving ground for blatant discrimination against special needs students and used to test how many IEPs can be violated without parents' knowledge, how many federal laws and ideal law can be broken, including the destruction or elimination of special education? Who is running our special education department? Several requests for an organizational flow chart are ignored. The DPS website is an example of discrimination under Civil Rights 504, ADA, and IDEA. Virtually everything on the website concerning special ed is either non-working, non-existent, or obsolete. We have requested an accounting of the special ed funds that the district received and who is spending it, what is spent on, and, and that request has been ignored. We want to know who is controlling special ed funds for parent involvement. What is the policy and process for parents to utilize the funds? We would like a full investigation by the Department of Justice, the IRS, and the FBI of all persons, <laughs> consultants, and companies receiving and spending federal funds for special education in Title I. We request a full audit, a full public report of all federal funds coming to the district, how the funds were spent, the names of the consultants and companies that were paid, because those requests have never been answered either or addressed. <laughs> the DTC East Vocational School is infested with rats. We have 16 doors that need repair. The East and West schools have ADA violations. Parents have not been given a description of the curriculums. Why do we have a Michigan Rehab Service office in our school that is allowed to hold our children back to age 25 before sending them out for training? Why did Robert Bob cancel the liability insurance on the vocational needs students and adults that prevents them from getting vocational training and skills in the community? Why are our children forced to remain in ADA violated and unsafe buildings until the other school is refurbished? We need someone to talk to immediately about this and other concerns. When parents report issues, they are targeted and threatened. I was one of them. Somebody changed my address in the transportation um, database. They put, they canceled my child's uh, pick up instructions. They changed my phone number so nobody could contact me and I would have been in a situation with the police and protective services if I had not caught it in time and, and told people that I was working with the boards, working with RISA and, and, and trying to help the parents in the district. When we report that these problems happen, we are brilliantly lied to or we're told that we're going to have protective services called on us or we're going to be turned into the police. And if we have viable uh, solutions and actually really want to work with the schools and, and the principals to help resolve some of these problems, we're told that it's causing problems, that it is someone like me and other parents who bring these six issues seconds to, warning, please. to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, as uh, Mr. Schneider said, it, it's our bylaw and, and protocol to not respond at this meeting. But I, I think I should say, I think I, I think I should say this: I have authority as state superintendent to direct that our special ed department uh, investigate this IEP issue. It's the only area, frankly, that we have responsibility or authority as a department. Now, all these others are local decisions, but I think uh, you, you've certainly raised enough questions that uh, I'll ask that a report be presented to the board um, because, well, the, I'll leave it in a general term to say that the IEP situation uh, needs to be examined and, and we have a way to do that in an investigation. Um, because that appeal might come to me, I probably shouldn't comment more other than to say this would institute a, an investigation based on our special ed department's uh, work. Absolutely. It's absolutely essential. It is. I think we've got to get the bus aids back on the buses, too, if there's anything we can do about that. We, we, I mean, I'm trying to find the ground that we have authority on. We don't have authority specifically on their decisions on budget, we do have authority if an IEP either calls for that and there's not one, or if an IEP, if there's <coughs> shenanigans going on with IEPs, which has been inferred. I'm not 
saying that's happened. I mean, that's what the investigation has to uncover. But if there are IEPs that should be in place to call for an aid, then we need to make sure that happens, and that's part of our investigation unit, so we'll commit to that. And I, maybe I just mentioned one other thing. It, 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 as, you, as I'm sure you do know, it's, it's the governor's call on March 1 whether or not to renew uh, uh, Robert Bob. And so, but at this time, I think that uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, appreciate your comments. Appreciate the board uh, allowing this discussion before you take a short break here, and that, that folks who travel this distance could, uh, could appreciate your. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.